Okay, it looks like we're ready. So, uh, Martijn and uh, Joao, uh, is, is was it well pronounced? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, we're uh, uh, nice enough to propose a presentation on uh, a presentation on Mevada. How do you pronounce it? Yeah, it's a good question. <laughs> 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 Actually, there's a slide about that. <laughs> um, so you have the floor. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. So my name is, is Jean Gouvet. I'm with uh, Anubis Networks. Uh, Martin is with uh, Virus Bulletin. Uh, we did uh, what we think it was an interesting work ab around uh, Mevat, which we are going to tell you the story about uh, what we did and what we saw. Uh, so uh, s just as an introduction, because uh Is it better if I am pressing <laughs> the <other>? hey. <laughs> <laughs> um, we, we test security software, such as uh, antivirus, anti-spam. Uh, we organized an annual security conference. We were in Seattle uh, two months ago and we'll be in Prague uh, next year. And we also uh, published technical articles, including several written by, by people in this room, which is cool. And if you have something uh, interesting you want to write about, something technical, do, uh, do let me know. We're actually hiring at the moment. Uh, so uh, yeah, if you're uh, desperate for a job, or just want a job. Okay, so um, if you, uh, last week I was preparing for this presentation, and then I realized that I don't really know how this malware is pronounced. Um, I always call it Mevada for some reason, but uh, it may as well be, be uh, Mevade. And, and when I asked this on Twitter, some Russian guy actually told me it might be a uh, Mevade, because uh, it may well be Russian. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I, I will call it Mevada, but uh, it may well be uh, Mevade. Um, some people actually, some antivirus companies call it Sefnit, and uh, also the name SBC is used. So um, the goal of this presentation is, is twofold. Um, on the one hand, we just want to tell the story of, uh, of, of Mevada, of this botnet. But on the other hand, we want to tell our story of, of fighting this botnet, of chasing this botnet. And uh, we want to show you that to chase a botnet, you don't need to uh, to start with a malware sample. But there are different ways to do that. And I think that that's interesting uh, for, for people in this room. So um, last week, everyone was talking about the Regin, which is uh, this very big, scary uh, um, malware that uh, NSA and Jesus Cube probably have written. Uh, people call it people who who know what they're talking about call it the most advanced malware ever detected. Uh, compared to this elephant of, of a malware, Mevada is really a tiny mouse. It's it's not very advanced. It's it's nothing that any people in this room probably have to worry about because if you practice general uh, security hygiene and and have a working antivirus, you probably don't have to worry about it. On the other hand, if you look at the number of infections then uh, Mevada is an enormous mouse because there are millions of infections, whereas uh, Regin is a, is a tiny um, elephant because there are really only a few targets. We don't know them all, but still, they're, they're not going to be more than a few hundred, I guess. So Mevada first started to appear on the scene about three years ago. Um, I think the first public blog post dedicated to it was from Microsoft, <coughs> who in... Uh, January 2012 added detection to its m my malicious software removal tool. Uh, they called it Sefnit, and uh, they wrote that this, uh, this Trojan family uh, moderates and redirects web browser traffic from search engines like Google, Yahoo, and, and even Bing. Um, this, of course, makes it um, uh, makes it bad. It makes it malware. It, it, as malware goes, it, it, it's relatively harmless. Uh, and I say relatively because it, it is harmful, but uh, it doesn't steal your, your banking details or, uh, or uh, encrypt all your files on your hard drive. Um, after this, things got a bit quiet around Nevada. was not much news. Um, it doesn't mean that no one was detecting it or looking at it, but it just wasn't very interesting. And, it, and it's good to know that a lot of malware out there 
not many people are looking at it, not many people are writing about it. Uh, so so what if you read the news, you probably are more likely to read, uh, so if you read the security news, you're more likely to read the, uh, the stories about the, um, the technically interesting pieces of malware uh, rather than the ones that are, are very prevalent. Uh, and then suddenly something interesting happened in September last year. Uh, when the Tor project, and I think we all know what Tor is, uh, reported a sharp increase in the number of connections from every single country. Uh, and, and when I say sharp increase, I mean that in, in 10 or 11 days, the number of connections um, increased by a, a multiplied by a factor of five or something, which is I enormous. I mean, this was three months after uh, Edward Snowden had come out um, with, his, uh, with his NSA leaks. So it seemed uh, unlikely that this was the case, even though some Tor users got very excited and said, hey, finally people are using Tor. Uh, this wasn't very likely, um, but this was, was enormous. And then um, and there was, was one interesting thing, because I said that ev every country in the world saw more connections to the Tor network. There was one notable exception, and uh, this is uh, Roger Dingeldine posted this on the on the Tor talk mailing list, Roger is one of the people behind Tor, and he wrote, um, I'm compelled to point out that this table has one data point that will keep the bellies of conspiracy theorists full for months. The only and only country that didn't gain was Israel. And that's actually interesting. We'll, we'll see uh, why later on. I know some people from Israel here. <laughs> and uh, yeah. So um, what was happening? Well, uh, Jonathan Kleinsma, a guy from uh, researcher from Fox IT in the Netherlands, who I know uh, sent some spies. Uh, over here to see that I would uh, credit him uh, correctly. Um, he, he was the one who discovered what was <coughs> the cause of this uh, Tor network increase. Uh, and it was a large botnet. And in fact, it was this particular botnet was uh, Nevada, which, uh, which had added the Tor component and, and which we then just found out was e extremely big. It wasn't the first botnet that used Tor for command and control communication, which I think we all un understand why it makes sense for a botnet to do that but it was the first one that by doing so really uh, skewed the Tor uh, statistics. Um, he also found some uh, command and control servers, um, which also shows why, uh, why people call it SBC. Okay, so having, having said this and having kind of set the scene about uh, Mevada, uh, Joao was gonna, gonna talk about, um, about stuff he, uh, he does and, and they do, uh, which ultimately led to, uh, to our, uh, our discoveries. So, so the goal of, show of showing you this slide is uh, basically just to explain a bit of what we do and the way we do things because it connects deeply to how we conducted our research, uh, me and Martin, on, on the Mevade stuff. Uh, so we developed a, a fairly recent co concept around uh, looking at uh, security events uh, as, as a sort of big data. Uh, and, and try to come up with a technology that allows processing all these events that are happening in real time in a large scale uh, in order to extract valuable uh, threat indicators. Uh, so in order to do that, we worked in on two main pieces. The one uh, that you see on the, on the left side is, of course, uh, a variety of information of uh, uh, sources of information that we, we collect. Uh, I mean, we have pretty much uh, a bit of everything from sinkholes, from honeypots, from traps, everything that you can uh, think about, analysis, web website analysis, malware analysis. The whole idea was to collect all this information uh, as much as we can uh, and push it as events, as things are, s are happening, uh, into a, a high-performance complex event processor that we built, so that then we can use that together with an API uh, to extract valuable information from, from the data and provide it to subscribers. And this, uh, in a nutshell, it's essentially what we did. And then, of course, you have on the right side different ways to access the data. The API, which is by far the most interesting thing probably for, for, for you guys uh, or any researcher, but also dashboards, connectors, and stuff like that. But really, the, the central piece is the, the event processor and the flexibility of the API. So in a nutshell, it's really I all about streaming. So the it's it's a different concept because traditionally we are used to looking at databases, uh, and that's not about it's not what we're doing here. We're just uh, collecting events and making them available 
uh, as, as streaming. Uh, so we built this complex events processor. It really uh, follows a, a publish subscriber module. So it's really easy to publish data and to and to get data out out, out of it. Uh, it's essentially REST, and uh, all the events are in JSON, so they are it's really, really easy to use. Uh, being a complex event processor, the idea was, okay, uh, not only I want to access the data, but I want to do something with it uh, in real time. I want to be able to correlate, I want to be able to measure, I want to be able to, I don't know, think about it. There's a lot of, of stuff that, uh, uh, as researchers, we want to do on top of data. And uh, the idea was to make that available in real time on the API. So there are a lot of possibilities in terms of post-processing, uh, which leads to uh, one important thing. So one of the sources of information that we have is a fairly large sinkholing infrastructure, uh, which uses precisely this technology that I was mentioning uh, as a way to, to get data about what we want to sinkhole and why. Uh, essentially, to do that, we have this uh, sort of array of sensors around the world. I don't like the, the word sensor because normally it has sort of a negative notation, but it's really what it is. So it's uh, uh, we are collecting information from several countries. Um, essentially, it's uh, it can be other things as well, but nowadays we focus a lot on on DNS and, and HTTP. It's by far uh, the type of protocols that gives uh, give us more more rich information that we can use to extract threat indicators, uh, and like I said, so this is collected, uh, it's pushed towards a complex event processor, and then it's available to researchers and their tools to 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 work the data and find and find stuff. Right? That that was the the, the main goal. Uh, in order to find stuff, in this case, things that we want to sinkhole. Uh, we of course use the API, uh, and then we look at at things like the like the ones mentioned here. So we look at sp very specific traffic patterns. We look at domain rotation, volumetrics, frequency, uh, and it ultimately what this allows us is to detect uh, what I like to call a, a, a new cluster forming uh, since since its inception, which typically leads to uh, normally a new botnet, which can be new botnet from uh, old malware, new malware, but it's really the detection of this new cluster forming that allows us to, to be fairly uh, quick at sinkholing new stuff. And of course, detecting DGAs as well, uh, like, like these two examples. These are just two examples of DGAs easy to detect using this methodology. Uh, I'm not not going very much in detail about this because tomorrow there is going to be another another talk by Pedro Camel, which is one of my colleagues. He's going to to explain in in, in deep detail, basically this part, uh, what we are doing on on this part in terms of of research. The end result is also is always okay. Let's this is a bad botnet. Let's sinkhole it and see how it looks. Just some numbers so that you get you have an idea. Uh, it's very lar large. I don't know. It's 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 difficult to compare with others because there aren't many numbers out there about sinkholing operations. Uh, ours usually we track around uh, uh, seven million infected devices over a 24-hour time window, which is is a lot. Uh, and this, of course, generates a, a, a lot of traffic, uh, and we make that traffic available as events. So it means that you you can actually see what's going on with a, with a with an infected device when it's checking in with a command control or is dropping some stolen information. Uh, it's a lot of information. I put there number 6,000, but in reality, sometimes it's 10,000, 15,000, it really varies. But it's a lot, a lot of events happening per second on this, on this infrastructure. And of course, we track, we track a lot of uh, malware families using this. Mevade being one of them, of course. Uh, and I was explaining how we detect new botnets using this methodology. So Mevade was uh, indeed a, a, a good example. Uh, this is a, a, an interesting picture because sometimes it's pretty hard to explain to less technical people all this about the, this sort of living organism that botnets are. So this is a good picture about uh, how Mevade looked uh, when we first detected it. So you have the, the command controls are the... the the reddish balls and the rest are the 
affected machines. So what we saw in our, uh, first, so basically what we saw was uh, a bunch of queries, uh, uh, NX uh, means non-resolvable non queries to a fixed set of 21 .su domains. Uh, they very much consisted with what we would expect from an automated behavior. So you have you have a certain frequency, a certain frequency that leads you to believe that is a an automated beacon. Uh, we will see multiple geogra geographies, of course, uh, and uh, an in interesting indicator was that we we I believe w we have a pretty good knowledge of the botnet space nowadays. But if we will look at these IP addresses and compare it with our knowledge, the overlap was really minimal, which means okay, this is uh, something new going on. So uh, up to this point, of course, the decision is okay. Let's let's sync all it and see what happens. Uh, and this is what we saw initially. So essentially, we will get uh, post requests against two specific resources: cache or policy. Uh, interesting particularities. So none of the requests would ever have a user agent. There was always a, u a user uh, unique ID header uh, for some reason. And uh, the post will have, of course, of course, a binary payload included. So very quickly after sync holding, uh, we saw around five, uh, uh, half a million infections on over maybe a, a 24 hour window on the first day. Uh, this picture that you can see is, is the geographical distribution of the infections over a 10 minute time frame. So it's bots checking on the on the CNC, measure uh, over 10 minutes, and you get this picture. Uh, it's a lot more, of course, but uh, 10 minutes is thi this is what you see. Uh, at its peak, uh, it reach it reached a bit over 1 million infections. So it's uh, it's uh, like Martin said, it's a fairly big mouse. <laughs> uh, one interesting fact was that there were absolutely zero connections uh, coming from China. I honestly don't know why, but that's a, that's a fact. We didn't do, we didn't see any connections from China. And then uh, up to this mo moment was okay. We have here some fairly large botnet, but we have absolutely no idea what it is. So let's try to do some some research on top of it because just as a reminder, this was all based on network traffic observation rather than samples. Uh, at this point, there were no, no samples to deal with, which is good is and is bad. It's good because you can see things when they start, right? But you, it's, not, it's not easy to associate it with a known malware family. Martin. Okay. Um, so this is when I came in. I, I, I should have said uh, that all this all the data, as, as you all said, belongs to Anubis Networks. Uh, this has uh, very little to do with my job at Fires Bulletin. Um, but Fires Bulletin owns my brain and, and, and <laughs> pays my salary. Um, so uh, yeah, this is when, when I came in at Trow, I said, hey, I uh, have this, this, this funny new botnet, it's very large, using uh, domains from the, the Soviet Union, which, as many will know, is, is very popular among uh, among botnets. But yeah, we didn't know what it was, so we uh, we started to have a look. Uh, we tried various possible CNC algorithms. I, uh, I never look at so many algorithms within such a short period of time. I tried to see if one would match, which it didn't, but I thought this may be an existing botnet moving to a new algorithm. We looked at Citadel for a while, but no, it wasn't Citadel. Um, we were actually convinced for a while that it might be sal Salaty because of some, some similarities, but no, in the end, it turned out not. Um, zero access was in the news when we did this research, which was October, November last year. There had been some major takedowns and the bot that constantly tried to come back, so kind of made sense that, that Zero Access would try a new uh, CNC uh, algorithm, but no, it wasn't that either. And we were at a bit of a loss, and um, we, um, we were at some point we thought perhaps it just isn't a botnet, perhaps it's just some bloatware using some DGA, because, well, using a DGA is not illegal or anything. Um, but yeah, we, um, well, wha what did you do when, whenever all else fails? Well, you look at one of the botnet sponsors and you just enter something in Google. We entered uh, the domain the, the domain that Shrao had singled in Google, seeing if someone else was looking at it. Now we found some virus total results, some URL query results, probably people, perhaps even people in this room who entered this and saw what happened. Obviously, because it was a single virus total, nor um, 
URL query is going to tell you anything interesting. But we found one interesting Google result. Somewhere in Thailand, there's a local network which uses a squid proxy, as sometimes happens for all HTTP communication on that network. And this proxy had a had a web server with a with a log, and this log was accessible by the public and it was indexed by Google. And it's still still there. Um, it doesn't go back all the way from to, uh, to where we were, and we didn't take screenshots then, but it, it's still there. And you can see um, for every day, you can see what's been going on. You can see uh, this is for one particular IP address on, on that network for a few days ago. And you can even see uh, for every domain when it was accessed, what, at what time of the day it was accessed. And so you can build a picture what, what someone was accessing. Of course, this is completely harmless because it's all metadata, and we know metadata is harmless. But yeah, you, you can find you, you can find a lot. So, so we could find out which user on this network. We have no idea who it was, but some user, some computer on this network was accessing the sinkhole, and we found some interesting things because it happened several times, several days in a row. And shortly before, there was always a connection made to what is my IP dot com, which is a site that tells you your IP address. And afterwards, there was also always a, a connection made to uh, this. Uh, free uh, domain. Uh, Angelica Jongerdijk is a, is a Dutch name. Didn't know what it meant. But yeah, some no IP uh, uh, domain name. And thirdly, we saw some links to uh, some adware. But that, that does, doesn't say very much because if you find someone infected, they probably have a reason to be affected, which is uh, that they're not very uh, good with uh, security hygiene. So they're probably running adware too. That doesn't necessarily mean that they're linked. Um, then Joao, through the Anubis network sensors, uh, did find uh, some other uh, correlation between these, especially the, the, the first two domains and, and our sinkhole domain. And uh, of course, this uh, this IP address, of course, this IP address still resolved to uh, uh, some uh, some IP address, which um, which led Joao to uh, to look a bit around, and he thought thought, okay, what uh, what would the the next IP address be? And and it turns out. If you look at virus total, that at some point uh, a similar domain name resolved to it, uh, olivasoni.noirp.biz, uh, which is interesting, and especially because he then found that this domain had indeed been serving Nevada or Mive, which which thought, okay, perhaps perhaps we are chasing uh, this malware. Now around that time, WebSense published what is actually a very good blog on 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 Nevada. Uh, unfortunately, uh, as sometimes happens with blogs, it was edited by a, a PR person who uh, wrote that this blog that was primarily targeting the business services, government, manufacturing, transportation sectors in the US, UK, Canada, and India, which sounds really scary. Of course, if you have a botnet with a million infections, then yeah, of course, some of them will appear there. They, they really made it sound like a kind of targeted attack. They mentioned it was c came from Russia, which made it even scarier and, and stuff like that. It's unfortunate because actually, really, the the research is is one of the best that's written about uh, Nevada. And, and it, for example, it it told us um, it, it said the following that uh, it found CNC uh, IP addresses in uh, one particular ASN, and and the IP addresses that I showed a few slides ago were on the same ASN. Um, so then we were even more certain that this was uh, Nevada. We we found some more uh, links. Um, and we we also found some more um, of these funny domains. Now, uh, as I said, this is uh, Angelica Jongerdijk. That's a that's a Dutch name. So, again, we we ended it in Google, and we found there's only one person, at least on the internet, with this name, and it's a doctor somewhere in America. Okay, well, it happens. Uh, doctors all have an MPI number. There's a website where they're collected. I don't know what an MPI number is, but it's I assume it's some kind of doctor registration number. Now, this this all of us Sonny ended in Google. Interestingly, we also found a doctor called Oliver Sonny. And there were a few other domains. Uh, one that I don't even know how to pronounce. But yeah, uh, again, there's a doctor. That this is this one letter missing in the in the domain name. And uh, they're not even only using an IP.biz, using another uh, free uh, DNS provider. And again, that's a doctor, again, with an MPI number. Now, at this point, I thought for, for a few days, uh, this is an extremely cool DGA, where they use, where they use this number, this MPI number, uh, which I somehow generate, and then they use this to, to look up a name of the corresponding doctor and use this as the domain name. 
And I thought, oh, I'm going to talk tell this at BotConf, and everyone will be so excited, and I will be so proud. Uh, it turned out to be it wasn't that, and uh, it's it's probably just. Uh, I mean, if you're a, if you're a bot herder, you you have a botnet, you probably have a lot of data uh, dumps from data breaches. You probably have a lot of names of doctors available, and you just look look some funny names and you register their domain names because, of course, these domains. Um, if, if you would look them, if you would come across them during some research, they look harmless. They look they look legitimate, unlike the domains that the that Swao earlier uh, showed, the, these DGAs, which which look so random that you're you're pretty certain that something dodgy is going on. So um, of course we looked at the payload. Um, this is um, the content of the post request, in, in, uh, the hex dump of it. Uh, I'm sure you all recognize it. Well, I hope, but it has I don't. But it, it's completely random. That is, um, and, well, it looks random like this. But uh, between multiple uh, connections, and as, we as I said, we saw millions. Um, the first nine bytes are always the same, and there's a lot of similarities, which means that uh, it's either just obfuscation or it's encryption with the same encryption key. Um, we don't know, and I'm as far as I'm aware, no one knows what this really means. Of course, you don't need to know because you can just replay the payload and you get something back. Um, I'm not sure if you can see that, but um, this is the HTTP response, and you get some JSON back. Actually, some error, but but interestingly, there's a stratum uh, mining protocol in in the header somewhere, um, which was indeed uh, a Bitcoin mining uh, server, which uh, which showed that this botnet was actually uh, being used to mine bitcoins. Which I know it's not the most efficient way to use a botnet from a from a cyber criminal point of view, but still, it's um, it's going to give you some money, and this is a, a huge botnet, even though probably in mostly infected older, not very powerful computers. Okay, so so what have we learned? Um, and especially, what have we learned about about the botnet? Well, this unknown DGA seventeen that that's how talked about. Uh, that's how we call it. That's what they called it uh, internally before before we knew it was Mivada. This was indeed Mivada. It was a, a non-Tor variant, which means that either it was uh, split off the Tor variant of the botnet, or it was it always been completely separate. I think the former is more likely because if you look at the number of connections to the Tor network during October, when we started seeing the, the, the sinkholes, um, single connections, uh, that actually dropped from five to four million around the time when so I think we'll start to see connections from zero to one million. So it would, would make sense, but there might be other reasons why this happened. This might be a coincidence. Um, this botnet was very, very large, more than one million infections. Um, and Mivada was engaged in, in Bitcoin mining, apart from search engine hijacking, which I've mentioned before, and, and other people had found it to be performing click fraud. All three relatively harmless cases of cybercrime compared to other things and it's not a rat or anything bad but still bad and and of course if you're infected then they have access to your computer and they could put something worse in its place now since um, since we did this um, we published the research I think in November last year at Anubis Network blog a few I things happened um, Facebook in April this year they uh, they wrote about uh, a new "Quote unquote new Mevada variant that doesn't use Tor." Uh, very good blog post. They said they detected a new variant of what they call Sethnit. Um, more or less what we had already seen, um, but they never had some interesting research uh, confirmed basically what what we saw. A um, month later, Microsoft uh, released its uh, at least a report about the last quarter of 2013, and it said that. Uh, uh, no, sorry, about, uh, at least re released a report about the first three quarters of 2014, and it said that compared to the last three quarters of 2013, the number of affected computers jumped from 6 per thousand to 18 per thousand, so the number of clean computers, sorry. And, and this was not so much due to Mevada or Sefnet, as they call it themselves, but due to adware that they found related to it. And they hadn't previously blocked or cleaned up this adware because it didn't seem to do anything harmful, and then they found it was actually spreading Mevada. Um, which they, and I think rightly, made, uh, decided, um, which made them decide that, yeah, this is harmful, this needs to be cleaned up. And then, uh, because there was still a cliffhanger, in, in 
July 2014, this July this year, Trend Micro published uh, a blog post where they uh, they found uh, a connection with some uh, with some adware, and where they actually found a particular adware uh, dis distributing uh, uh, Mevada, uh, which was developed by an Israeli company called Iberio Limited, <laughs> which 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 I think would well could well explain why. Uh, uh, why there weren't connections from Tor uh, to Tor from Israel no, no more? Because, uh, as we all know, most malware authors try to avoid uh, infecting uh, computers in their own country because uh, that's the best way to keep uh, to keep your lo local police um, away. Uh, I've since been told there are quite a few adware companies based in Israel, uh, all trying to do legal things, but not always succeeding in, in staying legal. And this, I would think, which is pr uh, clearly crossing the line. Um, okay, so conclusions. Uh, chasing botnets doesn't have to start with malware samples, doesn't even have to involve malware samples. I mean, we had some samples, we run them in sandboxes, but yeah, as usually with malware, it doesn't really do these days. I mean, my uh, my understanding of assembly is uh, is worse than my French, which says a lot. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, you can still you can still do uh, do malware analysis. And, and find cool things. Um, there's a lot of useful information out there on the internet, and as you say, on the on the public internet, indexed by Google. Google has been probably the most useful tool after uh, after Anubis Network's uh, sinkhole, sinkhole um, for this research. Um, botnets. Some botnets are really big, and even if you don't hear about them, they're still there. So don't don't just uh, take a uh, get your ideas uh, from uh, from the news. And finally, and we're, we're nicely on time, uh, adware can serve more than just ads, and, and this hopefully will not be a surprise to, to anyone in this room, but I think uh, it can't be repeated enough. Questions? Questions? H how come Tor saw an increase in in visitors from China, if Mavade was not in China, sorry, how can it, it, they say uh, the quote from Roger was that Israel was the only country that didn't yeah. see an increase in tour, but yet there wasn't any infection in China. Uh, no, that's not correct. That there wasn't any infection in China. Firstly, uh, the, the variant we looked at was a non-tour variant, and secondly, um, we don't know why it's not in China. But we saw that every time a connection was made to the sinkhole. Just before that, and like seconds before that, the connection is made to where does my IP dot com, which which makes me makes us believe that um, that it, it did something else when it uh, if it would find uh, would find it was in China and probably using the same geo IP database that that what is my IP used and what Anubis Network used to determine <coughs> the location of, of uh, the connections. Um, given that there were more than a million different IP addresses connecting in a 24-hour period, I would. Um, if we're just China blocking something, or, or uh, then I would expect uh, us to show up a few because China blocking can't be 100% perfect. This was really none of, of a million that were uh, connections came from China. The bundler programs that were distributing Cephnet yeah. weren't popular in China. They weren't popular in China. That's why you never saw it in China. But not popular doesn't, I mean, I can understand not popular, but no. Connection from one million from the the, the largest internet uh, country in the world. Uh, there may have been some functionality in the bundler bundler yeah. programs themselves that yeah. wouldn't present those particular packages in China. But I, I mean, I, I would expect uh, I can imagine that China would be very low, but someone would visit China with their computer infected in um, in, in in another country. So uh, I would expect a few to uh, if it was purely that, but. Uh, I, I don't know, but thanks. <laughs> uh, two things from me. Firstly, um, I should have publicly thanked Anubis for the work you did on Game Over Zeus, and I forgot that, so credit where credit's due. Thank you very much. You're a great help. And to anyone else in the room that I've also forgotten. Secondly, um, you mentioned um, use of a DGA isn't illegal, uh, but in the UK and I think across most of law enforcement, if it is connected with a crime, than it is, and merely possessing it yeah, in yeah. the UK, if it's linked with fraud or anything like that, we can prosecute people just for having it, because it's an article for use in connection with fraud. So um, just uh, uh, there are more ways to skin that cat.
Okay, th thank you. Yeah, no, uh, yeah, I should have said that when I said that there wasn't. I'm not a lawyer or a policeman, and I kind of made this up on the fly. There, it's probably not illegal, but yeah, y you know more. Hopefully, know more about law than I do. <laughs> It's my yearly exercise. So. Um, small question regarding the uh, single link. It's more for your colleague. Um, the thing is, um, I was wondering how you deal with uh, attackers uh, fooling your sinkhole by pushing data over there, and how you distinguish um, legitimate from fake data in sinkholing. Uh, yeah, it depends on on the on the malware. We do quite a bit of work on some particular families to make sure that uh, a request that is made against a, a sinkhole matches what we would expect uh, from from an infected device. Th I think that can 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 happen for sure. Uh, it, uh, if if you mean uh, making a request just to get registered as being infected, you can do that. Uh, it will register your IP address. Uh, there, there, there are. It's typical that we will see stuff hitting like crawlers, like other other research groups doing queries. That's pretty normal. Actually, seeing mo uh, bad guys doing that, we never, we never get, get it. We still have time for another question. So they can hear it at the back as well. Hi, my name is Dennis. I'm actually from Israel. Uh, pretty nice work, thank you, first of all. <laughs> and no, really, it's actually enough evidence. Do you have you contacted the guys from the Israel that you think uh, are responsible for this stuff? S sorry, have you contacted the guy from? Uh, can't you uh, name the Israeli company that uh, you, uh, said uh, that uh, you uh, think uh, are responsible for coding this? Uh, yeah, but, 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 but that research with... Um, was uh, Trend Micro who published that? Ah, I understand. So, uh, uh, yeah. Uh, so I it's Trend Micro made the research and the connection. Yes, to yes. Israel, I understand. And 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 we. And, uh, and you have you contacted them? Yes. And what they answered? We have contacted and any pro any any process from there? <laughs> <laughs> ah, you mean uh, no answer or <laughs> interesting? Okay. The red button. Yeah, that, that, that's kind of what I meant because I was aware of it. It's, it's Clean Software Alliance. These people, uh, they really try not to be illegal, but they, they sometimes fail. And, and we can all say that they might not try hard enough because perhaps they shouldn't start ads for companies in the first place. But I think the best we can do is, is work with them and make sure they don't just do illegal things. So I think these kind of initiatives that Holly talked about are very good. And I, and I do hope to make it clear that, that this, for example, this bit was researched by Trend Micro. That's why I put a screenshot on there. I just wanted to put all the loose ends together that happened since we did this research. Thank you.